Okay, folks, uh, we're still having a couple people trickle in, uh, but why don't we get started with the administrative side? Uh, first, not exactly administrative. As you know, uh, Ellen likes us to have a sports mascot uh, for each of our things. Uh, here's, this is the Sparta mascot for AC Sparta, sparta.cz, if you want to go and uh, visit the team. Uh, I will note that the Czech version of Spartan costume is seriously different from Hollywood's idea of it, a lot more clothing involved, which probably makes sense given the local weather. Um, uh, it does look like uh, Sparta have a game on Thursday. Unfortunately for us, it's at Ebrox Stadium, which is on the south side of the Mersey. So not really cycling distance, but if you left our meeting, got on a plane and headed uh, straight for Britain, you could probably still make the nine o'clock start time. Uh, we, we certainly encourage you to, to check out the team if, if you happen to be around. Uh, the next up is the note well. I think many of you have seen this before, earlier today possibly, or in past lives. Uh, this gives you information on and pointers to uh, the ITF processes and policies which you agreed to uh, in order to participate today. Uh, some of those uh, relate to how the standard, standards process works. Some of them relate to what contributions uh, you can make um, without uh, disclosing IPR, and some of them relate to what you must do to disclose IPR if you do make a contribution. Uh, I'll also draw your attention to the code of conduct. Uh, the ITF code of conduct is uh, basically there to make sure everybody feels uh, safe and comfortable participating, and we encourage you all to read and abide by the code of conduct. Um, Meeting tips, uh, if you want to follow the chat, uh, you can use Zulip, pound MOQ, or meet echo. If you are uh, uh, remote, you no doubt have signed into meet echo, but if you are local, we also need you to sign into meet echo, but it has taken the place of the old blue sheets. It is how we take attendance. It is also how we manage the queue. Uh, if you are going to speak, uh, please do speak into the microphone. This is a hybrid meeting. We have quite a number of uh, participants who are here uh, via uh, the remote uh, facilities. So make sure that they're part of the conversation by speaking into a microphone if you do. Uh, if you're a remote participant, uh, uh, please use the, the Q function and we'll call on you from here. We have multiple different screens so we can make sure that uh, you can be seen along with the slides at the same time. Uh, the agenda for day one, uh, subject to bashing, is an interrupt readout. Uh, that'll be pretty short. Uh, the summary of MOQT changes since 00. Ian will uh, walk us through that in his role as editor. Uh, then a discussion of map MOQT object model to transport. Uh, that will be uh, Alan. And then we'll go through the subscription issues, uh, focusing on the namespace slash track character set, subscription IDs, resource limits, updating subscriptions, and the evergreen topic of who picks the track ID. Uh, so uh, many, many thanks to Ali who uh, volunteered to be our primary scrub. It would be great if we can get some backup for him. So if there's anybody who'd like to volunteer to be a backup scribe for today. Oh, thank you very much, Emily. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, uh, anybody is, of course, welcome to dive into the tool uh, and help Ali and Emily out. And we encourage you to do so, especially if you have spoken, uh, to make sure that the minutes reflect uh, the points you were trying to make at the mic. Remember, you're going to the mic. Everybody remember that? Um, we also need somebody to act as a Zulip uh, relay, which is uh, essentially somebody who watch, watches the Zulip channel uh, to relay into the room in case there's somebody who's having some connectivity problem and can't uh, join the queue in the regular way. 
Um, normally I, I lean on my former Jabber people for that, but since we've moved away from Jabber, that seems a bit cruel. Uh, all it means is you're watching the, the, the chat. So the chairs can do it if nobody else volunteers. But if you'd like to take that duty, please let us know now. Okay, the chairs will just watch the queue then. Um, and with that, is there any bashing of the agenda? Seeing none, uh, why don't we go ahead with the interrupt, Eva? Oh, yeah. I, I think we have a very cool slide that Max right there so far. Yeah, uh, so uh, we, for the interop readout, we're still working on getting interop. There are a lot of people who are implementing the draft, which is good. Uh, I think there's five or six implementations. Uh, the, a lot of folks were not able to make it to the hackathon over the weekend, and so we're planning to do a, an additional hackathon day tomorrow up on the mezzanine level in the code lounge. Uh, stop by in between your other sessions or hang out all day. Uh, and then we'll hopefully have a little bit more interop readout to go through it at our second session this week. Um, I will say I think that the sum total of uh, interop between different implementations, I think the record is Martin Duke and I have exchanged set of messages. Um, people interopting with themselves have maybe got, I've gotten farther just talking to my, my own implementation. I think others probably have as well, but we're, um, we're getting there. Um, appreciate everybody's work and we'll, um, we'll, Hopefully I have more to say next later in the week. OK, so we'll do the interrupt readout again on Thursday if there's not something new to report after uh, Tuesday's work. Oops, we're uh, leaping into agenda day two, which is not where we want. Uh, so the next bit is summary of MOQ changes since the zero zero. Um, Ian, you're walking us through that? Jeff slides. Huh? Jeff slides for this. It's okay if you don't. I, not right now, unfortunately. Sorry, I just got a flight about uh, 35 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> You're good. You're good. <laughs> it was it was a little close. Um, and so I very much apologize. Um, so a number of changes were made, uh, mostly to fix things that I think we all probably wanted to be fixed. Um, so Martin Duke helpfully uh, clarified what version and extension negotiated negotiation might mean in 295. Um, mm -hmm. That was somewhat editorial, but some sort of somewhat normative. Um, setup was split into two. Um, there were quite a number of editorial fixes. Um, and subscribe hints were added, uh, which is a very uh, substantial change, which added a huge amount of functionality in terms of like what you could subscribe to and how. And so thank you to us for that. Um, we also added subscribe fin and subscribe reset messages, uh, defined a control stream. So that simplified a number of things um, and closed a huge number of issues. Um, did I miss anything important? I'm going to. I'm not remembering off the top of my head what else. Um, <laughs> I think those are the critical issues. Um, we clarified something that was, I think, clear before, which is MOQ has no TCP fallback directly. Um, if one wants to use MOQ over TCP, then one can use web transport. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Apologies for not having a slide about this. Uh, so somebody in the chat has asked uh, MeetEcho if they can uh, raise the volume on the streamed content because it's pretty low. Uh, so if anybody from MeetEcho is listening, uh, can you check uh, the output volume on the streamed content? Thank you. Okay. So uh, yeah. slides down. Uh, if you can put them up and drive while I will ramble to them. And my client keeps disconnecting, so my plan to share the slide screen later. So this is object model to transport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Hey, so 
I'm stepping away from the chair's desk. Uh, I, I, I like this. I think the presentation is largely independent, but just in case, uh, consider it an individual contribution. Um, so mapping the object model uh, to Quick or Quick Streams. So if you were at the interim, you know we spent a lot of hours talking about this, uh, and people have um, very you know strong opinions. Uh, there's, I think we definitely have consensus that when uh, an MOQ publisher is sending objects or uh, tracks through a relay, it should be able to tell the relay in some way how those objects ought to be forwarded on subsequent subscriptions. So that, that control belongs with the publisher. So there, I think there was agreement there. That's good. So um, we're lacking consensus on how the publishers are going to convey this, um, this signal. Uh, and given how the rounds of discussion we had then, I, I'm sort of of the opinion that not, I'm not sure anybody's going to be convinced that their position uh, is that they're convinced to change their, their position. So the question is like, how are we going to move forward? So I'll walk through the different um, options. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, some people like the idea of this is signal being implicit. So the way the publisher signals to the relay how to forward something is by how it chooses to place an object onto a stream. So if it wants objects one and two to be on to be forwarded over a single stream, it will send them to the relay on the same stream. And uh, so the relay is going to serve objects to subscribers in exactly the same way they were received. So this implication is that if your relay is a cache, that cache has to remember how those objects were received so that that information that can be replayed later. Um, this can allow for a very arbitrary mapping of object to a stream. You could have 17 streams for a group and stripe objects across them. Um, there's not really a limitation on how it does, uh, what the mappings could be. So that could be a fertile ground for innovation, or it could also be very complex for a relay to have to capture those things. So there's trade-offs there. And things uh, can get strange maybe if they're a reconnect. So you might have... Um, the way, thing, the way objects are received at a relay may look different depending on the network conditions and how many times the um, track had to be reconnected. But there's no additional wire format overhead or additional messages we need to uh, um, create. Um, so that, that is sort of what we mean when we say implicit, this is what we're talking about. I'll just like pause for a second, maybe as a clarifying question and make sure I captured what we're talking about. I don't see any, okay, next. Um, so there's sort of a sub version of implicit signal, which is uh, with a one-to-one -one mapping between groups and streams. So that means that uh, in addition to signaling uh, how the relay should forward, it, there's an additional restriction, which is that you can only ever put objects from the same group onto one stream. Uh, you cannot mix them. And the end of the, group, end of the stream means the end of the group. Um, if you want to have uh, every object in its own stream, every object needs to be in its own group. Um, so uh, that might be restrictive, like if you wanted to have different priorities within a group, it's some imp quick implementations don't really support the idea of changing the priority of a stream in the middle of the stream, uh, so that could be complicated. Uh, and that maybe there's a larger overhead for when we make the number of groups very large. So for example, audio has been brought up. So I'm gonna pause again and see if it does, it, does that like a fairly, good capturing of what we're talking about. We're talking about using doing a group per stream. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then not implicit signal, but an explicit signal. So this means that mock messages are gonna carry information about how the relay should forward it. So there, there have been a couple of different proposals around how, to, how this could be done. One is that it goes into subscribe okay. Uh, tells you that like there's going to be a mode or uh, there's been another proposal that puts some information into an object header um, that tells the relay what to do. So um, this creates the possibility of forwarding something in a way different than the way that you received it. So uh, is that a bug or is it a feature? Uh, so you, some people think that that is a bug, that the relay should have to do exactly what, what the people, I would say the implicit camp likes the idea that if I sent it to you over one stream, you got to forward over one stream. But here I could send it to you over one stream and have you forward it over n different streams. And so is that a feature or is that a bug? So fanning out from one stream might be a neat, neat, neat thing to do. For example, if you have a reliable link inside your data center, maybe the one stream is fine, but then you want to have the uh, 
you want to fan out at a relay. It's like, maybe that's something you want to do. But then fanning in might, doesn't sound as fun. If you have like, oh, I received objects from this group in 10 different streams, but they all told me they want to go out on the same stream. So now I need to figure out how to merge them together into one stream and that may create buffering problems. Um, so when you have explicit signaling, it means that the mapping uh, has to be something that's defined in the specification. Uh, and that limits us, the, the possibilities for innovation are limited to what we can come up with and write down in the document. And then any new mappings would have to be implemented at relays uh, in order for the system to function so that it may slow down um, evolution of the signal. Is it, am I correctly capturing? Does anybody want to say anything more about explicit? Okay, next. Okay, so how do we wanna move the working group forward? So uh, this is my observation that um, if you're using implicit, an implicit signal can be observed if the draft is defining an explicit signal, right? If you're sending, you, both signals are visible. Uh, if you add an explicit signal to the draft, the converse isn't really true. If we don't add an explicit, a place to put an explicit signal in the messages, uh, then the only thing you'll have is the implicit signal. So um, this is my proposal, which is that we add an explicit signal uh, to the draft now, uh, and we're gonna gather implement implementation experience and data. We're gonna find out uh, if that meets, can we build the applications we want to build using explicit signaling? And uh, we can reconvene uh, in four or eight months and uh, confirm or reopen this decision based on data and experience, implementation experience. Um, so, uh, if somebody is implementing a relay and they really don't want to implement this case where things are forwarded differently, where the explicit and implicit signals do not match, uh, we can make that, we can allow that to be an error. Um, I think that might look at this potential hurt interoperability, but it, at least um, uh, it may be a way that we can move forward now and not be stuck in the traffic circle. I see, uh, oh, the queue filled up fast. Yeah, look uh, at that. I think the next slide was about. Um, are there clarifying questions on this slide or um, there's only one more slide? Uh, so I, I actually want to make uh, clear one thing that I think you intend, but um, maybe didn't quite say is that um, there are multiple proposals now for how to do the signaling. And so what will go into the draft is a sing single proposal for how to do the signaling. Um, and one of the things that we would revisit after um, implementation experience, just like we revisit all things when implementation experience guides us in another way, is whether that's the right signal, even if we stay within the explicit signal path. Um, because we might say, hey, it turns out this mode thing uh, as an explicit signal has some downsides that the object thing doesn't have. Let's switch from mode to object or vice versa. So that's part of the analysis that needs to be done over this period of time. So do you, do you want to take these or do your last? I just, if, is there anybody you want to, are they, are they clarifying? Are there, okay, again, there's only one more slide. So unless I, I'm tempted to just go on and then open the queue. Because I think the next slide says like, let's join the queue. Um, okay, so next steps, everybody join the queue. Um, let's talk about how to proceed. Uh, I don't think we should spend too much time having technical arguments about implicit versus explicit. We spent many hours at the interim doing that. And so I don't know that doing so is going to change anyone's mind. Um, so we um, would like to eventually get to a place where we can do a show of hands, uh, seeing are we willing to move forward with adding explicit uh, signal to the transport experiment and gather data and then look again. Um, and then if there is consensus on that, then we will designate a small group to write a PR to add a signal and we can discuss. Ian ran to the mic, so I'm gonna assume that that is a clarifying question. This is a clarifying, oh, sorry, Ian Sweat, Google. Um, that's quite a lot. Um, I was going to ask if there's a PR for the signal uh, that is being proposed. The only, there isn't a specific PR. There's one PR that's open right now, I think, which is two assets, one on um, forwarding modes. Is it, or did that get closed? Uh, yeah, actually, there's not an open PR that has any modes right now in them. So we're not offering a specific proposal to merge right at this time. We're just talking about, is this an acceptable way forward that we're going to add an explicit signal to the draft? Are people okay with that? I think you're about to leave clarifying question territory. <laughs> so, is the question it, about an explicit signal or the particular? An explicit signal. Okay. 
Thank you. I mean, and if this, I'm sure this queue is going to drain lightning fast and then people are like, yes, of course we're going to do that. We could, maybe we have some time today we could talk about it, there's, which one, but anyway, Colin. <laughs> okay, but I'm moving out of clarifying questions. So if anyone's clarifying questions, jump ahead of me. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, my mind has changed towards the interim and I've, I've realized I was wrong on several cases and I'm much more things and maybe that happened to other people too. So there might be more, you know, Kumbaya consensus today than we think. So, Ooh, okay. Um, but uh, I think that one thing is going back to the bugger the feature on the implicit, not messing the explicit. Um, I view that as a bug. And I think that makes it much easier for us to get to consensus on some of this as well, right? Because it means it would be valid, not just for the next couple months or whatever, but for the final protocol. It seems reasonable to me that if they don't match to return. And the reason why I think that's the right thing to call it a bug is because you never really know how many layers of these things are or what's happening at layers after you. And if this isn't the right signaling for one of the layers, there's no reason it's the right signaling for the next layers either. I, I just, there's no one's brought up. I really, it's one of those features that has come up as, yeah, we could do this cool thing, but no one has a reason that they really need it. So I think it should be a bug, not a feature. And if we later identify that we need some sort of feature on that, we will explicitly signal the ability to do different things at different layers for different types of networks. Can so, I just pause real quick and say, if yeah. anybody disagrees on that point, please join the queue to say, no, we, it's a feature and I need it. Do it right now, but go ahead. Just want to make sure if that viewpoint gets captured. Go ahead. Go. Okay. okay, so that sounds pretty good on bug. Um, so I think that that brings things a little bit easier, closer together here on, as soon as you have that. Um, the, the, you know, the, the next thing on the um, explicit signal, I mean, like, I think there basically is fairly rough consensus on explicit signaling. Um, now, on the, the, the issue that was sort of hand-waved a little bit, on the implicit signaling, there is reconnects. And we know that that's a use case. It's been our use case forever. You know, somebody goes through a tunnel, disconnects, reconnects. Whatever is done with implicit signaling and errors has to not have the system totally break if you like if you get disconnected and reconnected again. That'll be obvious to things. And I'm sure as we implement this, we'll figure out the implications of that, right? Um, I don't think it has, I don't think it breaks the implicit or explicit stuff. I think it just means we need to think carefully. It means that an error where you joined partway through to pick up where something had disconnected is valid. Um, so we'll need to work out little details of that a little bit on what the errors are when the implicit doesn't match the explicit. But that seems easy to do. I don't see any problems there. On the explicit signaling, I think that when we start thinking about things like we want to do like priorities per stream and a bunch of the use cases that we've done, it's relatively clear that I think we need to put this in the object, not the subscribe. I think it's and we could now we're into the discussion of how we do it, which Maybe we should just kick that down 20 minutes in this meeting to a little bit farther. But I, I think that this is you know, really clear. It's explicit. There's a fairly clear starting point for how to do that. Um, and, and, that we should, and that that can match the implicit. And that there's actually, when I think about what everybody's positions were, that what I just, what I just described is fairly consistent with a lot of people's positions. So it's a big cue behind me, but I would like to sort of try and move forward with that. And I'd like to try and have that whatever we put in the draft, there is rough consensus for it at this point in time. And we will reevaluate that consensus at 119 and 120. But I don't want to put stuff in that, we, that there's no consensus for. That's my preference. Thanks. OK, thank you. Uh, looks like Mo. Uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with uh, going forward with um, some, some explicit signal uh, uh, as, as long as uh, we do require it to match the implicit. I think it's important to uh, back up and mention uh, the consensus that we had earlier wasn't just around publishers should uh, should decide this. It was more around uh, subscribers are not allowed to uh, dictate the behavior towards them and force the relay to fan out to multiple different subscribers in multiple different ways. That was the fundamental decision we reached consensus on. Um, and I think if you look at that and the reasoning behind it, we didn't want relays to have to conform to all of these different subscribers. But now at the same token, we may consider forcing relays to remap things based on publishers. It, it doesn't seem like uh, it, th those, two, those two aspects don't gel very well to me. So I think we'll end up concluding the same thing again. Relays won't have to remap according to publisher preferences either, which ends up becoming this, this case where it's a bug and it's not a feature. And so you must send to the relay the way that you want the relay to send on. And so then you end up with implicit and explicit agreeing with each other again. 
And it brings up, well, why would you bother to sig signal it if you already knew the way that it came in? And I think Will's argument for all of that was that we want to have the state of, of the delivery in the object itself. So that for caches and realizing things downstream, the state is already there instead of some other, you know, some other stateful structure internally. Um, so I think that's really the argument for having the explicit signaling in the protocol itself. And I'm fine with that and I agree with it. Okay, thanks. Uh, the queue is like, sorry, maybe Ted, can you, is it Suhas? Suhas. Uh, thanks, Alan, for bringing this. Um, I, I support the proposal. Um, uh, having explicit is useful. And I, I also feel that there are stronger consensus in the interim for explicit and it's good to experiment and, and bring, bring the results back to the working group. Um, and also on the point of, um, the, there, there are only few ways the mock object model can be mapped to the transport because there are only three or four concepts in the object model that can be mapped to the transport and they can be done only three or four ways. So I don't see uh, with an explicit signal, there will be for the point of, you know, we have to keep updating the spec uh, to get the release implementation, there are not many. There are a handful of them we can define. And at some point, as we progress into the working group, we can remove some of those things which are not useful. On the other hand, the, on the contrary for the implicit signal, it becomes really hard because any publisher can change any bit in the object header and really needs to make a guesswork. And not just that every other relay has to do the exact same guesswork and it becomes very relay, uh, relay implementation defined. So that's one of the reasons why I'm strongly uh, supporting this proposal. Um, on most point on should subscribers influence uh, delivery preference, there are some use cases where uh, they would like to uh, influence, uh, like if you're a recording server or if you're a real time or a live edge desk server, you want a different preference. We might at some point down the road think about it, but, but for this discussion, we, we can focus it as on the publisher side of the of preference setting. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Yuas. Will. Yeah, Will Loakamai. Uh, I am very much for explicit signaling. I think the implicit is quite brittle. And as we build complex systems, differentiating or the, an error condition or a retransmit from an in intentional signal from an implicit one is going to be very difficult. So the explicit is definitely the way to go. It's a very small overhead over the wire. Right now, you either put it on a new stream or you don't, which is one bit. I think if we introduce datagrams, and then we can go to two bits and we might throw a whole byte in there if we want just for future extensibility, but there's, there's not too many choices. The concern about having to revise relays once they're deployed to support new modes is, is a real one. So we should be very careful. We want very few mock transport updates and we want a lot of streaming format updates and we just want to build a system that can handle these. And Mo covered my earlier point about preserving state, right? We don't, you, you assume that data is coming in and going out, but I am one of the enthusiasts for using this for VOD. So it might've come in two months ago and I don't want to have to create two records in the database, one to preserve the state when I'm already saving the object. I think it's easily done. Okay, thanks. Ian. I'll just... Um, yeah, the only reason not to do an explicit signal, as I think I mentioned in some plan chat, is just because we don't really know what we're doing. Um, and so we're going to probably have to change it later. We're not supposed to tell people we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we definitely don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we are very clear about that. Um, so we're going to have to change this later. Um, but if so, it's basically like get experience with the implicit thing or the explicit thing. So I'm fine with whatever. But I think that that would be the only argument against. I just want to like throw that out there. Thanks. OK. I think that's one of the reasons why I'm just making it the sort of like, we're going to continue to revisit this. Like we, we recognize, much like priorities got merged earlier. Like we're just, we know there's a lot of degrees of freedom here and we need to build real scalable applications on top of this thing to make sure that it is not preventing us from building the applications we want to build. Ted. Oh. Yes. Chair cage fight. Uh, <laughs> I can't take you, man. Sorry. I, uh, so uh, I just want to point out here that uh, while I'm totally fine with us saying at the beginning that implicit uh, must match explicit and that I'm very much in favor of it being explicit, uh, I don't think we can then trust that the system 
will always behave from the relay onward obeying the signal. Um, there are gonna be cases where when the relay gets the signal, they may not actually have the resources to fulfill the request. And the obvious one for this is if somebody sends you something in a mode that's one stream per object, but then sends you objects faster than the stream um, resources that you have received from the downstream client, you now have a question. Do you wait to get more stream um, resources because you're doing an object per stream, or do you coalesce uh, uh, in order to deliver the bits? And I think that coalescing in that instance would be reasonable. Uh, it, it's probably also reasonable for people to rapidly understand that it, if it hurts when you do that, you should stop doing that. Um, but especially at this point in the system, I don't think that, the, that this is more than a strong hint. It's, it's the desire of the publisher, but the system as a whole may still function better if we acknowledge that the relay may have to do something different if it's talking to a downstream relay or if it's talking to a client with different constraints than uh, the publisher understood. And uh, I wanted to say that here because I, I think the system gets more fragile unless we acknowledge it pretty much openly that that is the case. Thanks. I, I do think that maybe there, that will be controversial. I suspect there are other people who would jump in the queue and say, you better not do it differently than I told you to do it. Um, the example you gave of to coalesce or not to coalesce could also be part of the preferences expressed, which is like, please send an object per stream unless you can't, um, could also be an explicit signal. Uh, so uh, I don't know if people, but maybe we don't need to decide that right now. We can wait till we have a PR and we can argue about that particular point. Um, but thanks. Luke. How are you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I missed the first uh, 15 minutes because my toddler refused to go to sleep. But um, uh, yeah, no, I'm one of those controversial um, opinions you're uh, <laughs> you're looking for. So first off, completely agree with Cullen. Like, I just if implicit doesn't match explicit, it's it's just a bug. Like, it is it is either a bug for um, like I accidentally sent all of the wrong streams. But I also think from an application's point of view, it's a bug. Like, so Ted's point, Ted was like, well, the encoder decided to put them in this one stream mapping, but a relay decides to arbitrarily shuffle things around. It means that the decoder can't make any assumptions about what, what arrives. Like, if the encoder says, I'm going to do a stream per group, and then the relay is allowed to say, no, nope, screw that, I'm doing whatever it wants, and that you just can't assume any behavior on the decoding side. So I think if, if, you, if it's an explicit symbol, a signal, a relay has to do it. Like it is, it is a either drop it or, or do it. That's kind of the, the, uh, the two lines there. Uh, okay, I just I wanna get your opinion on the, the road forward here. Is it okay to merge an explicit signal or go forward adding explicit to the draft? And I, so I've only heard people so far say they want explicit to match implicit. So if it has that constraint as well, is that can you move forward with that now? Yeah, I think the my main problem with explicit is just how you signal on the wire. Uh, I think like having Boolean modes is just very fragile. Um, and I think when you start making it really like, you know, this number is the stream ID, it, it basically re-implemented quick streams. So I think that we can have explicit, it's just really hard to get the implementation right. But if we can do it, then I'm I'm for it. Okay, so, uh, so let me just clarify. It, do you have, I, I think what I heard you say is that sort of just having a zero one was too simplistic for the applications that you need to build. Is that right? I, I mean, if we only have a few modes in the protocol, it just means you have to update every relay every time you add a fifth mode or a sixth mode. And I, I don't think that's going to scale. Okay, so the, the, the um, concern is that you, it's not that you have a mode that we can't express now, but a worry that we will have a mode in the future where we yeah. want, we figure out we want to do something differently. Yeah, I, I imagine there'll be a world where we just literally tell the relay, hey, put this on stream and give it a number. Um, uh, but then you have to figure out how do you know when a stream ends, for example. You need like an equivalent fin message. And I think we just go into redoing quick streams. But um, yeah, I just don't like modes. Boolean modes are just a really hard to update. Um, it's okay for experimentation, but I just don't want it in the final draft. Okay, so you so some explicit signal is okay. Explicit, implicit equals explicit, and you want 
uh, something more flexible than Booleans. Okay. Before we go to the queue, you have something from the chat where the question was raised whether this uh, proposal is something that must be used by all parties every time or whether it may be optionally present. I hadn't given thought to it. My my first impression is that it, if maybe there's a none or an I don't care and the relay just picks what's convenient for it and that could be okay if the publisher was not opinionated, but if somebody else in the queue wants to answer that, okay. they can. Mike, you're next in the queue. Mike. Uh, sorry, I haven't formulated any thoughts on the question in chat. Uh, so maybe cir circle back to that later in the queue. Um, but my uh, take on, on this general question is that it may be a smell that we don't have the right abstraction in groups and objects, or we're not utilizing that in a way that is conducive to layering. Um, and what I mean by that is, I agree, explicit should match implicit, and we should be explicit by using groups and objects or whatever that primitive is uh, to signal what the intent of the publisher is um, for relays to deliver downstream. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm in the camp that you characterized, I think, as uh, implicit signaling, but the, the subgroup, which says we should do group per stream. And in that sense, uh, my take is that that is explicit signaling, uh, so long as we fix that in the draft, right? So if we say, you know, a, a group maps to a stream um, with the caveats of like reconnects and, you know, how we handle that, you know, um, then uh, the, the group gives us that explicit signaling. Um, yeah, so to me, this this is a, mostly a, a question about like, where do things fall between the mock transport layer and the streaming formats? And I feel like right now, group and object talk maybe too much about media and less about the underlying transport protocol and what the intent is for mapping things to that. Um, and so if we can if we can make those talk more about what we want to do with quick streams or web transport priorities, all those things, um, and less about the structure of the you know container format or whatever our media happens to be, then we can we can get better layering by by utilizing those to express intent about delivery, and then the streaming formats are free to experiment with different modes or whatever just by building on top of that. Thanks. I mean, I think part of my view is that having an explicit signal, like for example, what you're saying, like, can we do everything by saying a group maps to a stream? I think maybe we, it's possible we could get there. If we, if we put in several nodes now and we find that no one uses anything except that one, or we're down to a very small number of use cases, maybe it'll be possible to eliminate it. Um, but I don't think we are now. I don't think we have the information now. Um, all right, thanks. Uh, Colin? Um, so this goes back to sort of Ted's comment from a while back, but I think I'm very much with Luke here on, I, I think that the relay should do what you tell them to do. And if they can't do that, they should not forward your object. And maybe you find out about that, maybe you don't, but they shouldn't do something other than that. Now, that doesn't mean we couldn't have a mode that says, yeah, send this any way you want, right? <laughs> or something like that. But I, I think it, that explicit signaling to me definitely does mean that. And it comes back to Luke's point of, you know, when middle boxes can arbitrarily change stuff on you, it becomes very difficult to build really reliably implementing systems. Um, I, you know, there's this comment of like, the, the, the groups and the objects are meant to be joined. The groups represent join points in the media where you can re resume things and certain other types of operations on fetching the data. They're nothing to do with how the transport is. I think we should keep that very orthogonal from the transport things. And, you know, people say like, oh, we don't know. Well, I mean, like this stuff was like, like we discussed some of this in the RIP draft, which was published in 2020. Okay. It's almost been four years that we've been implementing and doing some of this stuff. So there is some experience here. It's not like no one's ever done this before. Um, and I think that a lot of that evidence does point at that we need more than a single mode of group per stream. I think we've sort of come around to that. So I think we do need something here and we're, we're coming around to that and we need a, you know, to Luke's point again, a, a, a flexible mode. We're gonna to have to think about this. We're gonna find, 
implement, you know, as we implement it, we're going to find little places where like, oh crap, wish we didn't do it that way, we'll refactor it or whatever. But I, I think that we need something along those lines that um, is flexible enough that we not only hit the applications we have today, but we hit the likely applications that people are going to try and put on relays later without doing the relays. And, and I, I don't really think there's many options to choose from. So I think it's pretty easy for us to get there. Okay. Thanks. All right. Will, I can't see other. Will, Jonathan, Sue us. Yeah, sorry. Cullen basically made my point. I think group per stream, we, we can't enforce that because group is the join point. And if you're doing frames, per stream, per group now, then you've got an awful lot of groups that you suddenly have to individually index inside your relay. So that that's not a mapping uh, I would support. We also, the streaming format is going to propose a prioritization scheme that it feels is a good response to congestion. So the, the streaming format wants to enforce a certain behavior such as drop older groups, for example. And it, it therefore needs to control this. So this is a, another necessary part for, for the deterministic part of, I, I want every, every hop to do this. And it's been pointed out that if you're a relay provider, you maybe want some flexibility to do something else because you've got fiber between on your lines and you, you're not going to have congestion. And I think, but the trouble is a, a publisher never knows if the subscriber it's talking to is the final subscriber in the last mile or it's just another node um, in most cases. Now in a relay system, we would actually know, like if, if a CDN node's talking to another CDN node, we might just privately agree to go to off and do something else. And I think that's our own business. We can, right? But the spec should say that every node should forward in the same manner such that it goes to the end user ultimately uh, in the way that the publisher intended it. Okay, thanks. Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan Lennox. I mean, I think I, I like the idea of an explicit signal in the abstract. Um, I think well, the reason I started complaining in the interim is that I didn't like some of the you know, explicit, explicit signals that people were proposing in the concrete, that I thought they were far too restrictive. Um, so part of this, I mean, saying an abstract, an explicit signal, great, but I need to see what it is before I say whether I like it. Um, uh, See you in Brisbane. I'm yeah, sorry. or probably an interim, <laughs> given the, this working group. Um, so, um, but yeah, I think um, what my preference would be, you know, an explicit signal that says, you know, basically the way the publisher would have liked to map it to streams if nothing had gone wrong and, um, you know, give it full flexibility for that. And oh. then um, obviously things can go wrong and that's why we have this explicit signal you know, for the reconnections and whatnot, but that's roughly the scope of explicit signal I would want. Okay, thanks. Suhas. Um, I kind of want to reiterate, the mock object model is very simple. There are only three, three things in there and there are only streams and datagrams. Um, either we set it as an explicit, uh, exactly saying how it has mapped or not, there are not many mappings. And also mock is so early in its development. There are many applications. Every day I talk to people, they come up with new applications they want to build on mock. And anytime we anything we freeze right now will basically hinder uh, the developers. And also at the same time, we need to keep the flexibility option open so that the relays need not have to keep changing. So my, my uh, proposal would be to kind of go with um, the few handful of mappings that we have along with another signal that say can relay change if, if it's needed or not as an experimentation thing. But going with the proposal with explicit, we can keep it as the standard, but the experimentation would be really about what happens if relay remaps. That, that can be an ex another explicit mode as Kalan was saying. Okay, thanks, Mo. Yeah, Mo Zanati, just to address um, uh, Luke and uh, Mike's uh, point about uh, is stream per group uh, sufficient for all use cases? Uh, I don't think it, it is because while I think it's probably gonna be the dominant use case for video mappings, um, I can already envision cases where it wouldn't work or wouldn't work well enough for an application um, because what, what, it, what it forces you to do uh, is buffer at the application. You have to have a reorder buffer to get groups out of order 
uh, if you wanted just a linear delivery uh, for recording or something, um, then you would you could ask for a stream per track and get that quick layer to give you that guaranteed delivery order and not implement reorder buffers at the application. And on the opposite extreme, if you have a very complex app that can do very complex things with the video, like restore it on a frame by frame basis, then you don't need the head of line blocking imposed by, by stream per group. And you make it ask for stream per frame and do your video repair and concealment on a frame level. And you're willing to implement those reorder buffers at the application level. So I think there's not an easy way to see that one mode is gonna work for all or even almost all applications, even if we think that we're gonna start off with the stream per group for most applications today. Cool. Uh, Victor? So I, I just want to point out that because you may have loss on the, the channel, somebody is going to have to um, manage the, the fill of any lost um, streams inside lost packets, right? Um, and your decision at that point is, as you point out, whether you're going to have the quick layer do that for you uh, and not deliver it up to the application until that's done or you're going to have the application layer do it for you. Just and to clarify, Ted, I wasn't talking about uh, the loss. I was talking about the latency from head of line blocking of the frames. So okay, even but, if you're willing for quick to retransmit and incur the same bandwidth overhead as you would before, you don't want that added latency of waiting for that retransmission. And you can do something to conceal and render good enough video in the interim okay, until so you get those repairs. I, I agree with that. But what I'm pointing out is that there's another condition um, where what you have is a situation where you may be missing things and you then have to decide whether you're going to create the buffer to retain, to, to restore them at the, the transport below mock T or at the application above it. And um, whether mock wants a signal about that is part of what this discussion is, right? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Uh, the next person in queue is Victor. Okay. I, I, do you want to maybe launch the queue? As well, it mind? seems to be kind of petering. Okay, out, we'll so. see. I'm, well, I'm just worried that somebody's going to say one more thing. It's nice and small. Now. All right, go ahead, Victor. Nothing controversial. Uh, I'll hopefully not. Uh, I think that we will inevitably change things. But one thing, so at least in the interest of making progress, one thing I will note is that while we don't, we're not sure about what stream mappings we will need. Uh, we kind of have some intuitions that about like which of them we will definitely need and we can start with those and maybe add more later. And at least I think everyone so far agrees that I am under impressions that groups per object is something we will need to implement at some point. So that might be useful starting point. I'm, I'm not suggesting it, but that's at least one thing that I feel like uh, everyone agrees we will need at least in some cases. Uh, uh, regarding explicit signaling and matching it what on the wire, I agree with Luke that it would be really bad if you take a group and then just split it into objects that are delivered out of order. Uh, I Theoretically, the opposite is not as bad as in, like, you can just put entire connection and put it over TCP and then everything is serialized, but but, it, but then like that still works. But uh, I don't have a particularly compelling case for like that either, so. Uh, okay, thanks, Luke. Yeah, something controversial. No, I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, we'll, uh, I definitely think this is just a try it out and see how it goes. I especially think if you come from an RTP background, it's really hard to 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 let quick do more things uh, and also figure out what you can do in quick. Like to Ted's point, you can have streams arrive out. You can read from streams out of order. The head of line blocking is a is almost like an API decision um, in quick. Uh, you but you can actually read uh, frames out of order just fine. Um, so I think we'll we'll get more experience. I, I think uh, we'll we'll get closer. We'll try and figure out, um, and we're we're going to be open to trying new things and removing modes in the future. So I, I think it's really good to to be flexible. We won't have a right answer here. Um, so yeah, let's 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 make it generic. Let's make it uh, flexible. Okay. Thanks. I'm okay. Uh, 
that was the last in the queue. I did want to read one thing that uh, Mike wrote onto the chat uh, before we take this, and that is uh, the way we currently define groups is oriented in terms of media properties rather than transport properties. And I think we should flip that around to get better layering. I, I think what we're talking about today is to say we, we currently have the semantics of group and objects be related to the media properties. And this is the way we're allowing the publisher to say how they get mapped onto transport properties. That's the core of the question we're, we're doing. I think that's a, a better way of putting it than I had previously heard before. So I wanted to repeat it to the group. So with that in mind, uh, the question I'm asking the group, and I'll do it in the tool in a second, but I wanted to give people a chance to uh, uh, bash the question because I know someone will, uh, is for the next draft iteration, we propose a set of explicit signals to allow for the mapping between the media properties and the transport properties. And I'm gonna be asking where yes, the raise hand is yes, I'm in favor of that. The do not raise hand is no, I'm not in favor of that. Are people okay with that wording? Will, I knew somebody would bash it, get up. Clarifying, Clarifying bash. You, is it possible for you to type that, Ted, I, and share your screen so people- Yeah, can, can you put it up so we're not arguing over memories? Um, I don't think we should use the words media when we're talking about mock transport. We've decided before that it's, it's a binary transport protocol. The media mapping comes outside of it. So yeah, just ch take the word media out and make it, the, yeah, object model application defined. Just an, just as an administrative note, unless something terrible happened, uh, rather than having this do not raise hand business, you should be yes, no, and no opinion in Miraco now. Ooh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but. The, the system could absolutely make a liar out of me, but that's what supposedly happened. I was not in the session this morning, so I can't verify it. But Oh, uh, Luke has a hand as well. Luke. Yeah, and I was going to clarifying slash whatever. Um, we're not changing the properties of mock transport based in this mode, right? Like a group is always going to be a sync point. Uh, we're not like we're not going to have a mode that changes what mock transport properties uh, exist because that that that's where it worries me a little bit. No, I, I don't think I heard anybody. I don't think that Ted was proposing that at all. Um, okay, Lou, or Mo? So Ted, can you just clarify, is the question, can you live with this design or is this your preferred design? Because I think some people in the implicit camp would prefer implicit, but we could live with an explicit signal anyway. So it may influence how we vote. Okay. Would you, you prefer us to be in the rough for this or would you prefer us to be a positive I'm actually yes? typing it so that you can look at the typed thing and figure out. Okay, hold on. So we'll give Ted a second to type because it's hard to listen and type and react and stuff. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to call a hum. I would, if you please hum if you like humming. Now, hum now. Oh, hum now if you don't like humming. Mm. Oh my God. I think it was inconclusive, and I like humming enough that. I was going to add my editorial comment that I'll remind everyone: we will revisit this. <laughs> there is no chance in my entire life that we will not revisit this. Like this is not the end; this is the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm in an action movie, Ooh, like at the end of like the sequel. It's like being set up. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen now. Uh, let's see. So I have to unshare slides. Share screen. Tell he's in the permission dialogue, we're in big trouble. I love that Meet Echo gave us a new screen that's been shared and it kept displaying the same thing. Ooh. Yes. All right. Bash bash again with this in front of you.
Any bashing or clarifying questions before we? I don't see anybody in the queue. Will's got a hand up though. Just say bash, Will. We know you're. Sorry, bash. bash. Uh, is it how just the objects map or how the groups and objects map? Well, I originally had a media object, media yeah. properties. Uh, how about if I say mock object model? Mock is, that, is that a mock object? Should it be like capital O, a mock object mock and object. a mock group? Or object model. And a mock track, because that, that's our complete object model. So mock groups, tracks, and ob or tracks, groups, and objects map to transport properties. OK, Luke, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I guess I'm asking my follow up again. Are, are we these signals? Are they changing what it means to be an object or a group? I don't think so. So, and the, the whole idea is that they it, don't, it's, right? It's how they map to transport properties, right? Like, what does that mean? Well, so whether they go on one stream or two streams or whether they... Um, why, are... why would you... Sorry, now I'm going to bash, even though I thought this was the most best constructed thing I've ever seen in my life, Ted. Um, how about map to quick streams instead of transport properties? Or, tr or transport I, constructs because datagrams are included. How about oh, okay. trans transport, transport tra constructs because sure. we, we might have datagrams in there at some point. I, I, you're totally right. Yes. All right. But, but Luke, I'm 100%. I'm this doesn't change anything about what a group track or object is in any way whatsoever. I think everyone's solid on that. Yeah, right? yeah. Like there's yeah. objects yeah. are still atomic, whatever. You know, like All groups are still, still sync points. Yeah. Okay. Everything yeah. we hate and love about them remains. Yeah. <laughs> It changes a few things because streams are ordered, but yeah. Any more bashing? Where'd the raise hand tool go? I can't find the raise hand tool. Is it down at the bottom? Okay. Who took the practice session and knows where the show of hands tool is? I, I took the practice session and I still can't find it. The bar graph? The bar graph. So it is. The bar graph? The top of the, the second icon on the left. Oh, well, I do not think of this as a bar, bar graph. You're like, they messed up the Cisco logo. <laughs> no, that's, that's not it. Oh. <laughs> it was almost there, and then it was terminating. Oh, FC Sparta. I want to vote on that. I don't think that's a title. I think that's the question. I am flabbergasted that they managed to implement this and still get it wrong by defaulting you to no opinion if you didn't pick anything. This is insane. <laughs> Wait, what do you think? I mean, the fact that they, as soon, like as soon as you guys hit it, the, everybody who was logged on the blue sheet was automatically no opinion without selecting no opinion. It completely defeats having that choice, right? It's like insane. Hmm. Anyway, uh, we're getting the data we need. All right, just for old time's sake, if you clicked yes, please hum now. <laughs> if you clicked no, file a bug report with MediaEcho. <laughs> if you deliberately clicked no opinion, please go to the microphone and explain why. <laughs> 
All right, uh, we're terminating the show of hands tool. Thank you, everybody. That was a productive conversation and a decision has been. Did someone uh, actually just click no? Just, yeah. Okay, who wants to, was it you? Just to see if it worked or you want to say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today in QA properties. <laughs> That okay. was an explicit signal. That was a good signal. All right. Okay. Uh, well, I, okay. So um, that is good. Um, I, we will, the chairs will, um, and the author and, and Ian will uh, find someone to uh, write the first PR, and then we can argue about the exact spelling of the signal next. Um, it's two o'clock. We're halfway through our hour. Um, the, we have subscribe issues. Do we want to talk about subscribe issues? And then... Um, uh, if we run out of subscribe issues, we can argue more about if people want to advocate a particular um, kind of explicit signaling, or do you want to take 10 minutes and have people argue about that now? No, let's, let's do the subscribe issues now. Okay. People, Did people... we figure out if what? I need to try to figure out how to share my screen? Okay, so you're going to share your screen. Uh, or, did you, or did you do it again? I have to go into permission. Down. I think it's not. Okay, so a uh, screen share is being started. Okay, does it let me choose a window or does it show the whole? It'll let you pick a window. It says it's being started, but it didn't actually. Did you? Oh, oh here we go. Accept. Accept. And then... <sighs> so now that we have a much more functional oh, version of subscribe make, with uh, what was formerly known as subscribe hints. Uh, we now have a number of issues that have come out of that, which are very productive. Um, I'd like to go through most of them relatively quickly, but this one probably deserves real thought. Um, and I'm not sure what the working group is going to decide. So um, very simple question. Are there restrictions on track names and name sources? Um, and yeah. I wrote the slide, my cats are Rocket and Gracie. <laughs> um, so it can be binary or it can be no restrictions whatsoever, ETF-8, uh, RFC-3986. Uh, we need, do need to decide, ideally. I mean, obviously, we can revisit this just like we will everything else, um, but it'd be great to decide fairly soon. So, Victor. Uh, I'm a fond of no restrictions because if there are no restrictions that means you don't have to validate and reset the connection <laughs> uh, which is something you ideally should do if there are restrictions and in practice there will be context in which there will be restrictions and we would put some escaping like the url style escaping but uh, even when you escape the actual contents that is no restriction, but like that just seems to be the easier choice. So you're advocating for an opaque sequence of bytes, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I, I'm going to say the same thing as Victor, but I'll explain it slightly different. Um, I think the question is, are there any restrictions? I, I think it's where in the system are there restrictions on this? So when we're talking about a catalog format or something, or how things might get done at the sort of layer above um, mock transport, I actually think that it's, we'll probably end up with option three or something. But what I want don't. But what I want to do is canonicalize that and put it into a form of what the relays need. And for what the, the messages that we're passing in the in the that we're talking about in mock transport here with the, the scripts, that the only thing we ever do is, is compares on these. And I don't want to be doing any of the canonicalization type things or UTF-8 type processing or any of those things at that point in time. So as far as mock transport is concerned, I think that what it should say is option one, no restrictions. Now, something else above that might say that it's actually option three that ended up in there. I'm not, I'm not against that. I'm just saying that in the transport, in the relays where I'm matching everything all the time, everything will already be canonicalized, and I will not have to do any processing that is slow and painful. And instead, I'll just do you know, bitwise compare. So I'm arguing for option one at the mock transport, but that doesn't mean it won't be option three somewhere else in the overall mock working group. Just in, in this part, it's, it's option one. Thanks, Helen. Uh, that makes sense. I, I'm going to pause for a moment. Is, 
Is that the general consensus of the room? Okay. Is there someone who strongly disagrees with that? Oh, thank you. Do you compare these objects, these names? They currently have a quality comparison only. Qual equality comparison quality. only. Yeah, so, so uh, it would be very sure that you don't get the name from two different sources that disagree about can canonicalization. Yes. So uh, if uh, you want to restrict this, you'd better get that restriction in for quick. I mean, DNS is in theory a binary protocol that just this case insensitive. It was a design mistake, but uh, comparison is hard. Yes, I'm very familiar with the issues of case sensitivity, and it's very painful. And do not review it. Okay, to us. Go for it. I, I, I think Colin and Victor explained my case here, and I, I, I at the transport layer, my my one of my goals is to have a uh, build a system that does real fast bit comparison and works at the uh, at, at like millions of connections coming through. And I would not want a uh, string comparison or any formatting of the string to be done to compare to one way or the other way. And I'm totally fine with uh, if, uh, on, if you want at the layer above mock, if you want to have more detailed uh, way to represent that, I'm not uh, posing for that one. Cool, sounds good. Oh, no. Oh. Mosinati. Um, I agree with uh, what Colin said too, but I think there's a little bit of devil in the details. Um, the spec, I think, would have to say very clearly where uh, escaping happens somewhere else and that it must already happen before the point of checking for equals in some parts of the protocol. Because like for your, your last example, you know, rocket space equals Gracie. If somebody puts that escaped in one way and it was published without an escape and the subscribe comes in escaped, you know, they're equal in the, you know, after canonicalization is done, but they're not equal binary literally um, coming in. So we'd have to very clearly say where, when you do a binary compare, that they have already been processed by something that does the escaping for you. Yeah, I, I think the intent here is that the mock transport would do the binary compare and be completely opaque to character sets and all the other things. Uh, but you make a good point. Yeah, I mean, this clearly needs an editorial note at the very least, because otherwise it wouldn't have been brought up because, uh, yeah. Oh, Luke, one more. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the finer details about all the different encoding schemes, but I will say that the name and the namespace are meant to be human readable. Like they're meant to show up in a URL and they're meant to be even error messages, I want to put the, the name of the track in there. So I think at least option one, I, I don't know, like it just it just makes things harder. Uh, it means that you the protocol supports something, but kind of like <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I, I, as long as we can find some coding that's easy to do comparison for um, it's this is going to get hashed anyway for people saying you're just doing a, a byte for byte comparison. This goes into hash map. It doesn't matter. Um, so as long as it's hashable. Okay. Thanks. Um, I will write a PR to that effect. Um, I mean, I think there's a whole nother conversation about namespace since we haven't really described exactly what the implications are and how it relates, say, to the... So we've got a late-breaking Christian entering the queue. Web object model and stuff. Oh, Christian. Christian, are you for the next one or this one? No, for this one. Uh, I think I am with Havard on this one. I believe that uh, the, the name should be somehow strongly typed because otherwise you have security issues. Example of security issues, a bunch of receivers conspire to get uh, canonically equivalent but binary different version of media stream and they force the relays to uh, have as many copy of that as, uh, as they want, uh, etc. I mean, there are I th I think I think you need a strong type. Thanks, Christian. I, I think we all agree that that's a concern.
for for sure. Um, There's a, yeah. another cue form. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Victor and Martin. In mock style. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I I I can see. Like you would need to have specific attack in mind, but uh, in general, binary strings are strongly typed. In fact, this is a, one of the strongest and easiest uh, formats that do because, like, there are also the smallest security surface since you don't need to do any normalization or any sophisticated name matching algorithms that you can uh, introduce bugs into. Uh, and as we were discussing just that in the chat, but it is fine to introduce any um, requirements or restrictions on the application level, but on the transport level, you have a string of bytes and you treat it as a string of bytes. And if your application uh, treats it differently, then you uh, get to keep the piece. Of the stuff. May, may, I, may, may I respond to that? Sure. Go for it, Christian. Yeah. I mean, my, my problem there is what happens if uh, the one one uh, client subscribe with the emoji version and another client subscribe to the sket version and so you get, you get those two requests arriving at, at a relay they are binary different but if you propagate them all the way to the publisher the publisher is but they are the same uh, so you you, right. have, you have to explain to me what we do there uh, I was going to give you my short reply. I, I think the answer is one of them wouldn't work. One of them would fail and the other one would succeed because one of them but was the have, correct binary encoding and one of them was not. Was not. But, but we have to say that. We have to say that very, very clearly. When I say strong type, I don't, I don't go for it as to be binary or UTF-16. I, I say, you have to say very clearly what comparison means, what that does to subscribe, what that does, et cetera. Yeah. I think this is a case where like memcomp, like level comparison we're talking, but that's my personal opinion. The, the, um, there's a whole chain of that and, and, and the DNS uh, experience says that nah, it's not so easy. Okay, uh, just on the Christian, oh, responding to Christian, uh, I think that the concern is right there. And also going back to Ian's, your, your, your point that uh, the draft, to, uh, draft should basically say, by the time the name comes to the mock transport, what should have been done with it in the sense that what we are expecting it. And that way, if, if that is clear, then uh, some of those concerns can be resolved. And another point that Luke made about uh, the track names and track IDs to be human human readable so that it can be useful in URL or for debugging, I think that's a valid point. And in uh, just to state uh, in my in, in our implementation, we use the track names and track uh, uh, namespaces to be integers, not in URL. But a layer above the mock, we convert it back into the URL. So in that that phase, we we the idea here is that we get the integer comparison, not a string comparison at, at that point in time, and and then. Uh, at the end, end applications are wherever we log, we basically convert it into your, your, your string URL for debugging purposes. So we can that can be done all layer above as well. Thank you. you like yes, I do. Thank you, um, Victor. You are next. Uh, okay, so I think the last here is less of what the format is and more of that we say that the transport should not normalize in any ways the strings, and that's what we say when we say certified strings, is that the transport should keep them as is, otherwise well, bad things will happen. Well, thoughts? Just one concern here. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the binary blob at, at the transport layer, but what if when you encode your two cat emojis in one streaming format, you get an array of bytes that happen to match the same bytes coming out from a URI-based encoding in a hypothetical case. Now we have, a, we have a collision in our catch, right? We have two streams that have 
the same names because we've allowed infinitely many encodings to derive a set of bytes. So is that a concern? And should we go back to the notion, I think what Christian raised, where if we define just one encoding, then if they're the same array of bytes, well, then you're actually asking for the same thing. So to, not to be difficult, but I believe you're an author on the soon to be catalog draft. Um, and so I think you very much have control over this question. Right, I do, <laughs> but on, on the catalog draft, right? But what if someone else uses another catalog? Or uh, the point is a, a generic relay is gonna see multiple applications coming in and have to cache the content yep. and, and avoid collisions. So you know, how do we prevent there being bit level collisions uh, for the I, relay, unintentional ones? I mean, I think that's a good point. I, I think, you know, users of relays will presumably like do this, I hope automatically because people use like the catalog draft or some other thing, but I think you make a good point. Um, I think I mean, attackers of relays will likely use this. So you're right, you're right. The threat model is potentially interesting as is about actually a number of these topics. But, but um, this has nothing so, to do with this. This is how do you how do you stop two people from using the same track name, no matter how you encode them? And the point is, is the CDN is going to require authorization to use a given namespace. That's the answer to this question, even though I'm not on the queue. I'm sorry, but like this this like that problem cool. of how do you stop that doesn't have to do with the encoding, right? It has to do with people choosing the same name. I, I agree. I tend to agree with you. Um, also, the security considerations is either completely empty or almost completely empty. Um, and so if you would like to write a PR, you are very welcome. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, but I appreciate everyone's thoughts. Um, I am, I think I have clear direction on the editorial PR though, like if people want to write um, security considerations, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Oh, it's us. I, I think the conclusion that we want exact binary comparison and that the transport should not be aware of the character set and otherwise. Uh, so option number one. Um, so it's completely opaque uh, sequence of bytes for both the namespace as well as the track name. Yeah, but that, that is for the transport layer. We, we know that that moves the complexity up and we're okay with that. Yep. Okay. Um, now that we have subscription hints, Thank you very much to us. We very important issue. Uh, now we have a whole other number of other issues that we can now like go and resolve. Um, the first one is multiple subscriptions. Um, it seems like this is an easy yes, but I just want to run this by the working group. Um, can an endpoint issue more than one subscribe to the same track? Um, it certainly is semantically possible in the current draft today, but we don't talk about it and what one should do. And then we will follow after that. Oh, I already have three people. Victor? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but the more difficult question here is, okay, if you're subscribed twice to the same track, how does this look on the wire? Because I assume you would want to deliver, to get every object at most once. Those questions will be following. Uh, Luke? Yeah, so uh, yeah, there's, there's like another... four slides on this, by the way. So like, yeah, this is this is the starter question. We're just warm up. I, I, I was just going to bring up Alan brought up another use case where um, two different subscribes have different auth um, info. So you could have two otherwise identical subscribes. You somehow need to forward that auth info to the origin. So that means multiple subscriptions. Um, and you do need to duplicate the objects that come through. So that's that's one thing we need to decide. Like, do you dedupe subscribes or not? That's a very interesting point. Uh, Suez. Yeah, I, I think uh, we should allow multiple subscribes. Um, the, the PR on subscribe ID tries to do that one. Basically, the idea is that the track alias is the one that represents the full track name that we are interested in. And subscribe ID basically says on which each subscribe with a new subscribe ID basically says in the same track, where do you want to read from? And I totally agree with Luke that uh, we need to be uh, we need to say something about what happens in the case um, if you have duplicate that's coming. Uh, there are use cases where um, you, let's say you're in an elevator and you missed last 
three seconds or five seconds, and you want to kind of run that in uh, 1.25 times the speed versus the live edge you want to be uh, do want to go on the real time speed. In that case, you do, you want the duplicate to come because you want, because you lost those things. You want those things to come so that you can run faster and go through. In some use cases, where Luke was talking about where it's uh, it wastes bandwidth, um, it, it, we need to consider that. I don't I don't have answer for that. In general, for this question, the answer would be yes. <laughs> Thanks. Well, yeah, what's the intent when a client subscribes twice for the same track? Does it want the relay to send two copies of every object or is it expecting dedupe to occur? And if do we have to mandate that dedupe must occur? It's a function of the relay to dedupe any incoming request. I, I, think, I think this would be a great moment to move on to the next slide because that was exactly, yes. Um, so unless you... Uh, actually, okay. Did I we'll go over this far? one quickly. Did I go past yours? Huh? I, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling. No, in. no, 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 that's good. So basically we need a subscribe ID if you have multiple, because otherwise you can't figure out control messages. We have a PR for it um, that's in flight. So, you know, feel free to review, but like, it seems like that's where we're going on that. Um, but let's get to the mini questions. Uh, next slide. Oh, oh, Alan, did you want to? I, I just wanted to answer uh, Will's question about why you might want to subscribe to the same track. So now that you have subscribe hints, you some, could want to, if you're a relay and you have somebody, so you've got a subscription already for the live head and then somebody comes in and they want something older, you might need to issue a subscribe. So that's one reason. They're different subscribe parameters. Um, that's one. Another one might be auth, right? Or the relay is not, cannot do auth. It has to forward the subscribe to the origin to do off. This is not a CDN use case. I know that makes you panic. Don't worry. But like for a chat, it may be real. And so there need to be cases where you forward the subscribe all the way to the origin to get the authentic the, the authorization check done. Oh. 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 Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So question number one. Yes, that's exactly, yes. Um, so now we should discuss that question because I think that's, an extraordinarily interesting question. Let's discuss question number one, if everyone's okay with that. So um, if they overlap, let's assume they can't overlap for the moment. Um, you know, what happens? Uh, do we, we basically, I mean, the two options that have been proposed are the receiver of the subscribe, either like indicates information that says like, I'm only going to give you the parts that don't overlap for this new subscription because you already asked me for the other stuff. Or, you know, it's like a best effort, like should you do sort of model. Um, there might be other options, but I'm not sure what they are. Ted. Uh, Ted Hardy, personal opinion. Uh, I think the client won't always know that there's overlap in what they've requested. And I think the simplest thing for us to do at this stage of the game is to say that the, uh, the relay gives the client exactly what it asked for because it doesn't know why it asked for it. And at that point, uh, if the client figures out it's in fact getting duplicates, it cancels one of the subscriptions in order to dedupe on its own. Uh, and if we discover there's some massive use case in the future where uh, that's not speedy enough or something else is, uh, uh, is needed, we can adjust then. But I would say for right now um, that you just give the client what it told you it wanted. And if it discovers that it's getting two copies of things because of the, the way it asked the question in ranges, uh, it cancels one of them to, to, to stop getting it after it identifies the problem. That's certainly a simple option. Ted, can I clarify that so that you don't, it's not, you didn't want must, should, or may deduplicate, you want must not? Uh, I think Ted wants you get what you get and you don't get upset. Yeah, you get what you get. You don't get upset. <laughs> I, I don't think you even need RFC 2019 language for that. It's like, I told you, give me X and X plus Y. And the fact that you get 2X and you get halfway through X and you're like, oh, I got X already. I can stop this and move on to just asking for Y. That's up to you. <laughs> no, no, Ted, Ted you, you, you said must not for one. That's, that's, no, did. not, he, he did. you didn't say it in silent. You said must not. Uh, if, if you absolutely insist that there be RFC 2019 language, then must not is the best match. Must not, but we know you won't. Um, 
Uh, okay, so interesting. I could live with what Ted just said, but it was not at all what I was thinking. Uh, so uh, I think that the answer is different for live edge versus material that is, I'm going to call it cached, but old. And what I was going to propose is that uh, you should deduplicate on, and I only put should because I think there's race conditions that make it impossible to fully do de de deduplicate. Um, so you should deduplicate on the live edge, but you uh, what should you should do what Ted was saying must not deduplicate on when you're requesting old stuff that's being cached because you're actually explicitly requesting something old because you're trying to recover it for some reason that you lost it, and whatever we do on this design, I'm, you know, I know we can't have a design that requires the relays to keep track of everything the client's ever received. That's, that's one thing that we, we definitely don't want to do at that, that level of state management. So I think within those constraints, we sort of need to, to figure out the right thing there. And so my proposal was um, live edge, you dedupe. And if there's anything that you're pulling out of the cache, you don't dedupe. Uh, Colin, may I ask a clarifying question? What is the differentiation between those two points? Uh, it's whether the subscribe arrived before the object or not. Mm -hmm. So when the subscribe, when you say I'm subscribing to group 1000 forward or object 1000 forward, and th the current object is uh, uh, at, at 1200. Sure. 1000 to 1200 are cached. But you know when, the, but the subscribe arrived before uh, object twelve thousand and one arrived in your relay. On those objects that come on the relay, you look at all your. I mean, if you if you look at a relay implementation, it's got when a subscription comes in, it goes, "Hey, do I have a bunch of my stuff in my cache that matches this? If so, I need to decide to send that or not send it." And I'd not, I would want it not to be trying to guess what it had sent in the past when it made that decision. And then it's also. Uh, it's like, okay, and I'm going to add the subscribe to some sort of table. And when a new object arrives, I'm going to run through my table and figure out who I need to forward it to. And at that point, I'd be like, oh, if, I, if three of my entries in my table said I need to forward it to, to connection or session or something, I don't know the right word to use here, X. Steve. Right, Steve. Yep. I need to forward to Steve. I wouldn't forward three copies. I'd only forward one, one copy, but only right. on the things coming in. So that's, that's sort of how I think about it because it seems to be – uh, it meets the use cases of not using up extra bandwidth on the live edge. But again, I could live with what, you know, uh, Ted said. And it allows you to do something as an application, like you realize you lost something for some reason, a networking error or whatever else, and you have a chance of going back and getting it, even though it might have been sent, the relay thinks it sent it to you before, you just didn't get it. Thanks. I appreciate the. That seems like, very, like a very reasonable distinction and like a totally like one that we can write up if, if we decide to go that direction. Um, thank you for clarifying. Luke. Hello. So um, I want to clarify the relay cache filling example. Um, so let's say they really has an empty cache. A viewer comes in and asks for the latest object or latest group. And then a short, like few milliseconds later, you get somebody else says, give me two back. And so you have to make a second subscription upstream. And then a new viewer comes and says, give me starting from group 60. And you're like, OK, well, that's not fulfilled by either of those previous two subscriptions. So I have to make a third one upstream. And the problem is, if that upstream request goes all the way through and you end up getting three copies of the object, that doesn't matter that much in the CDN, but it matters a lot for the first hop. You might have somebody broadcasting on their phone, and then all of a sudden they get three subscribes all at once that all overlap. Like it, it, that's almost that's a should de do. That's it. That almost a, not a must, but otherwise you're just gonna be you're just gonna be congested. You're gonna have viewers able to cause <laughs> you know like viewers joining a stream will basically cause uh, too much bandwidth on the uplink side. Um, so I do think we need the way to, to de do. Um, I do think that needs to be an opt in, like using the same track ID or something. Um, uh, I'm not sure why you would ever want separate copies of something other than so it really doesn't have to remember everything. Um, but yeah. Uh, clarifying question, Luke. So you're envisioning a case when the subscriber on a single connection is subscribing, say, to the source, but doesn't know, like needs multiple subscriptions that might overlap? 
I'm just trying to tease this out a little bit. Ba basically, having multiple subscriptions over a lossy link. Or not lossy, just a congested link or, or potentially. Um, I don't want to burst. Like, I don't want to have to deliver the same iframe three times because it's just going to cause user experience issues over congested sure. links. No, I totally agree. But I was curious, like, why the client, or sorry, why the subscriber would be um, having these overlapping subscriptions in this particular use case. Uh, I mean, you could have a stream in Twitch, for example, has zero viewers, and then the first three viewers join the stream. If they don't have an if they don't overlap, we would fetch from uh, the viewer at the same time. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Thanks. So, okay. Uh, here in the discussions, when I heard Ted, I thought that's the best solution, and I want to support it. Then I heard Cullen, I thought that's a better solution uh, than that. Uh, after hearing Luke, I see we need to support that too. So this, <laughs> so this, this is my, my, my proposal here. Uh, it's S for all the three. So, so, and the Luke's use case is a relay who, which knows two things, which knows the subscribes that's coming from the uh, endpoints, and it also knows its current cache state and its current live edge for the track. It can make a smarter decision when it asks to the up, 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 uh, upstream relay, uh, and it can basically, where, where the DDP is needed. I think we can add something in the subscribe request to explicitly say that. You know, I'm sending you multiple requests. Right now, I don't know my current state. The, the state of what Luke said is that I, my cache is empty. I don't know what would happen. In that case, state of the relay, since it does not know, it can basically ask. Saying that, uh, give me, I don't uh, give me, but with uh, DDoP enabled or disabled. But for the client on the other side, uh, which the, the endpoint client, it if it's asking for duplicates, it wants duplicates, and it, it should be given that. I think if we add along with the location or the hints that we have, uh, an indicator that says how uh, the relay or the upstream relay should be should serve the data, I think that would clarify those use cases. Yeah. Um, Are you next, Alan? Oh, am I? Shoot, I think we need to. That's okay. I'm about to lock the queue. So, if you think you're about to have an opinion on this, leap in now. Um, Alan from Dallas. So, I wanted to say that it's challenging to know when things are going to overlap because we have so many different ways to ask for things. And so, um, now we do. Right now. And, and it, the second point here about there you need to be some information in subscribe okay, because if you ask for something relative, then maybe subscribe okay should have the translation into absolute terms, because you need that information to know even what matched your subscribe at all. Like, I, I would support that. And I think probably that's a reasonable change. But like, if let's assume that exists now, I think, I, I mean, I'm in favor of not sending duplicates when we don't need to. So I think like at least a may in there that like you can deduplicate as long as uh, everybody gets what they asked for. And if the client library has to be like, oh, I got one thing in and I had three different subscribers that made this API call and I need to go each give them a copy. It doesn't need, I don't even have to copy the data. I can just give them a handle to the same object. Um, that that's fine, but we just have to make sure that the mechanism is there for that to work. Yeah. So just for everyone to clarify, that means that a subscriber needs to kind of debunk and basically dispatch like um, a get based on track ID to multiple subscriptions that have that track ID. Well, it wouldn't be the track. It, it would be the object and group because they all have the same track ID. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Okay. So. I think we really want the determinism that if a client asks for something, the, the relay gives it what it asks for. The, the, the notion of a client asking for overlapping or duplicate stuff is going to be an edge case. The use case of a relay having multiple incoming requests, as Luke has pointed out, and going forward or upstream, that's the normal case. But the relay's job is to aggregate. It has to intelligently dedupe those requests and make one request upstream that satisfies all of them, or as few requests upstream as possible. So I think the system breaks if we have these complex rules about is it the live edge or is it not? It should simply be, you, you, I ask for something, you give it to me, and a relay has to be smart about deduping, otherwise it's gonna flood the origin and then it's a bad relay. Um, who's, who's last, Nikim? Uh, Jonathan, thank you. Oh, 
Yeah, you guys able to hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, apologize if this is not in scope for this use case, but uh, one of the cases where we do want duplicate delivery is when we're if we want to support um, make before you break handoff of a of a conference call between um, two relays. This is like a common case where like a call is sort of or or most participants are associated with relay one, and we want to take relay one out of service, um, and we want to transition it to relay two. Um, and, and push the clients to reconnect. That's where you, if you really want truly gapless and real time, always live edge, not waiting and delayed, you're going to end up having to support duplicate delivery. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, as an individual, give my 10 seconds of thought, which is to say that um, in HTTP, like CDNs commonly, you know, do this all the time and try to figure out like how to like reduce the number of requests going to origins. Um, this seems like a problem we've solved quite a few times. Um, I'm inclined to not try to solve it at the transport layer because it seems scary uh, and complicated and that would imply Ted's direction, but that's a personal opinion. Um, but yeah, this is definitely not a, this is not a new problem. Let's put it that way. Um, anyway. Do we have enough? direction to move this forward, or do we need to table? Um, Colin. I, I'm behind the cube, but I'm going to ask. Yeah, okay. yeah. We, I, I would say a really quick comment here is, having heard this whole discussion, I've moved to, I think that for the, this ver, like the upcoming version of the draft, we should go with Ted's solution. It is by far the easiest to specify and implement. And if we learn it doesn't, it meets Luke's use case. And if we learn it doesn't work, like we'll, we'll, fix, we'll it. fix it, right? But it's the simplest baseline, right? So I'm, I'm, I, this conversation has changed my mind where we should be. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's exactly my thought too, is like, if we need more, we can do more. Um, and, but for now, if that's enough, it's, we'll find out. Like, can I make a comment on that? Of course. So if we, if we go to must not deduplicate, then I think we just killed track name alias slash track ID and replaced it with subscription ID. Don't say that yet. <laughs> I, did, I wasn't supposed to say that, say that out loud. Okay, I didn't say that. It doesn't. Okay, all right, maybe not. Ted disagrees. Think about it. Uh, I, I don't think. <laughs> I think we could table that for another day because, okay. like, we just made really good progress, and I'd like to like avoid like stealing our thunder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I do. Anyway, there was a okay. note taker question. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it was. Yes. I think uh, the summary is that when you. Subscribe to something. Uh, the intent is to receive everything you subscribe to, um, even if there are duplicates. Um, and I think that means that things should be returned. Mm, I guess it doesn't matter. Okay, never mind. Um, but yes, like you, if you subscribe twice for the exact same thing, you will get two copies of it. I was going to say something else, but it's not relevant. I was making a further inference. There was not result. Okay. I'll just. Okay. Updating subscription. Um, can endpoint update and open subscription for the same track name, subscribe ID, and change other things? Um, the perk is it's transactional um, and it's potentially possible to optimize for. Uh, the negative is it's a whole new thing. Um, and we already have unsubscribe and subscribe and they're already on a control stream. Um, there's also a question I have about threat models because this is not so similar from the recent HP2 like um, issues where like I can just issue like, you know, update, update, update endlessly. And like, I don't know, I'm not really sure in a few minutes, I can come up with a way to like abuse that pretty well. So, might not be ideal. Um, so, do people have thoughts, opinions? Yes, no. If we're okay with unsubscribe and subscribe for now, we can leave it as that and then decide if we have problems later. That would be my tentative proposal as an editor. Um, but I'd like people's thoughts. Oh. 
Oh. Sue asked, was in and then you left. Oh, the queue is, oh, Ted, the, oh, <laughs> the queue. If I can figure out how. Ted locked the queue and then put himself in that name. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Is it still locked? I it was. It. I unlocked it. It's a, a pretty cool move. Uh, <laughs> I really apologize. It was locked from before. Uh, so because we, we now know that you can have duplicate sub subscribes, uh, I believe it should be possible to do uh, two subscribes and then an unsubscribe in order to get the updated subscribe message, updated subscribe that you want, uh, and still meet Jonathan's use case of uh, being able to do a make before break. So I think, I don't think it's meaningfully different at this point from unsubscribe plus subscribe, but you might do subscribe, unsubscribe, scribe. Unsub <laughs> you might do subscribe, subscribe, unsubscribe, the first subscribe in order to get the update um, with uh, a make before break. And, and I promise I haven't been day drinking despite the fact that it's probably cheap beer. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Julius Krabacek, that looks, just looking at it like this, it looks like it's something that is trivial to implement and can avoid unexpected race conditions. So I would say, unless it turns out to be difficult to implement, keep it in. Can you clarify? So unless, uh, update, can you clarify what you're suggesting? What is trivial to implement? I just want to make sure I understand you. Okay. Step that uh, implementing, updating a subscription in the relay is not complicated. It doesn't, I mean, okay. something can happen, but it doesn't look like something that's complicated. It's yep. a small amount of easy to debug code. We might have it in the protocol. On the other hand, not having it and using unsubscribe, subscribe might lead to race conditions that might be complex to debug um, the complicated life. Oh, thank you. Can I just interject? Because the slide mentions race conditions. Yes. And I put that okay. there. So uh, updating a subscription is racy with subscribe fin because I there could be, a, the subscription could have ended and that fin could be on the way and then I send an update and then I get the fin. But the fin doesn't tell me since it has the same subscription ID, doesn't tell me if it was the old thing that finned or the new thing. But the TED solution of subscribe, subscribe, unsubscribe does solve that problem. Well done, Ted. Uh, uh, Lucas, or Luke first, and then Lucas. Luke, then oh, Lucas. sorry, I apologize, Luke. Okay. Oh, Luke. Yeah, no, I think we should, I, I think this actually bleeds into the dedupe discussion a little bit. Um, the, the main benefit of updating a subscription is you keep any state around, like which objects you've already decided to send or skipped over. Um, and I think I, I, I'd had, you could probably do it correctly, but I'm a little worried that subscribe, subscribe, unsubscribe either sends you too many objects or you miss or there's a gap or something. Like I do think that because there's an RTT difference between the subscriber and publisher, it's really hard to do a clean handoff. Uh, and resubscribe is a way of doing that clean handoff. Cool. Lucas. Hi, Lucas Pardu, Cloudflare. You, you mentioned HTTP2. Um, I, I'm going to admit I'm not that familiar with this draft still. Um, but is there a limit to subscribes? So, like, we have a slide on that. Not slide. Okay. <laughs> part of the concern is mitigated about uh, of, of rapid unsubscribes and subscribes is mitigated by limits. So, I'll let you yeah. go into that one. Yeah, there will be. <laughs> <laughs> and th does that slide describe the mechanism for updating that limit? Uh, it proposes a mechanism that's basically identical to how quick would work. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> but thank you for foreshadowing my slides. Or actually, Colin. Is Colin. Colin. <laughs> I, I don't have super strong arguments one way or another on this, but my very much my gut feeling is that the being able to update an existing subscription is going to be easier to deal with all of the, the edge cases. Um, so I think I would lean that direction right now. Right. Like allowing the update. All right. Thanks. Uh, so, yep. uh, my proposal is also to kind of allow subscribe updates because if I, if if I think about the relay implementation, the code path that takes to unsubscribe is more involved than the code that would take to update and subscription. Wherein I I, I would basically update my cache pointers on, on stream if an update versus it's unsubscribe. I basically go start cleaning up all the state for that subscriber. Um, and if if the I, I totally agree. On, on the case where uh, subscribe update went and the stream was finished by the publisher, the subscribe update should get an error back. 
that's the only way either I, it, they may they might race with each other the publisher uh, the subscriber knows either it is a fin or uh, error one of those things might come and it, it has to give up on that point at, at that point in time so uh, my pro uh, proposal would be to go to one, option one there Ted, can you lock the queue <laughs> well you are sorry i paused it means starly just i i'm also a fan of updating the subscription it doesn't seem that complex uh however is the client expecting some notification in the object such as the track id to change to indicate that these objects are the result of the updated subscription or can the same uh track id if or alias be used i think that's a great question actually i think it's a very reasonable suggestion to change the subscription id because that would actually fix i think a few problems I think that means that an update is an implicit subscribe, subscribe, <laughs> unsubscribe. It's it's a two-phase commit, it's basically. The same as a subscribe, subscribe, update. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I think we're heading in the same direction. I guess one question I would have just for everyone is, um, is this something where we want to say we think we probably want this? But we don't want it in the next draft because at this point um, we haven't had a lot of interrupt even with the like newest version of subscribe and unsubscribe. Like, is this a why don't we say we think we want this but write it up later, or do we actually want to write it up in the draft in the next rev? Can someone give me a strong opinion on that? I'm not. I don't know strong or not, but I would say writing in draft does not mean that we have to work on interrupt for that. In interrupt, we can basically say we, we work on subscribe and unsubscribe. That's it. As the interrupt goals, but uh, draft is for defining the protocol. We should, if if we are clear on what we need to do, we should st uh, start making a, a work on that. That would be my. Sure. I May mean, I tend to like to put things in the draft that I think people are going to write code for, because otherwise we don't get feedback about whether it works. We've done that before. It's awkward. <laughs> uh, Luke. Yeah, I'll I'll just say this is easy enough though we can get some interrupt on it, I think. At least I can uh, implement this. Um, uh, uh, so let's let's try to throw in some text on this um, and do a reasonable job of it, and we'll see what happens. And uh, get feedback. Thank you. That's extraordinarily helpful. So the answer is we are going to um, attempt to add an update subscribe message, I believe. Okay. And people believe it is relatively straightforward to implement, which I think is probably mostly true. Um, and we'll get some implementation experience, hopefully. Great. So multiple descriptions could cause resource exhaustion. Lucas, uh, your slide. Um, yeah, so the, <laughs> the TLDR is, you know, once we have subscribe IDs, then we can, you know, make them monotonically increasing, and then we can have a max subscribe ID, and then it's basically just like quick streams all over again. And uh, we don't have to reinvent a new mechanism. We have a mechanism we've used a fair amount. Um, it seems to work certainly better than the equivalent HP2 mechanism um, based on recent experience. Um, any objections to this? Any thoughts? Sorry, man. Like my client died. Uh, Martin Duke, um, yeah, oh, the shoot, well, I lose. <laughs> oh, well, there's that too. Uh, um, yeah, so does WebTrans not have a, a, some sort of stream opening limit that we can leverage here? See you at WebTrans. It, it does, <laughs> but uh, subscriptions and streams are not tightly correlated. For example, yeah. if, okay. depending on how the object model is, one could have, say, like a billion streams that one goes through for a single subscription. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you use a uh, stream for object, yeah, so they're they're not just this okay. like Got yeah it. yeah not related. Thank you, Lucas. Hey, Lucas Pardu. Um, limits are great. The only question that raises with me: uh, what are the different limits across the different hops and intermediaries, and what happens when they don't align? You know, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, as number two, there's also the question of what happens if you don't have enough bandwidth? What happens if you don't have enough uh, max streams? Uh, what happens if you, like, there's a number of resource limits and, and we've 
really not touched on almost any of that at this point. I think it's a really complex and interesting question that probably we'll spend like a whole nother year on um, once we get this all. Yeah, this I think, thing I think yeah. punting on that's fine. If, if we just put it in a bucket of resource limits to worry about. I, I think I think we probably should have better text that kind of hand waves over it, but I, I think we're not at the point where we can really prescribe like a, a serious solution, but I think it's enormously important and complex problem. Okay, that sounds good. Cool. I mean, that's my opinion. Well, so I'm a fan of the limit, but nope. is it a absolute cumulative limit or is it a concurrent subscribe the, limit? It, it would work like quick stream ideas where like your subscribe ID is monotonically increasing. Right, so that's an absolute, it's that's an absolute, an absolute number limit limits, over like, time. But at the browser layer it, for web transport, we've converted it to a concurrent stream because that's what the application cares about. And I'm wondering, do we do, we do the same here? Because under the covers, max streams is absolute, but do we care about the number of concurrent subscribes or just the fact that if, if I've set it to 10 and I've used 10 over the last day, I can't open another one? I think I mean, I'm fairly sure this is just a matter of like the peer would give you more subscribe IDs as you close old ones, just like in quick, like as you close streams, presumably the peer would be expected. If it's trying to maintain 100 open streams on average, um, it would send you like a new max subscribe ID message. Uh, you, no, feel free to go back to my feed, like, yeah, I apologize. Then we have this, as you mentioned, we're trying to maintain 100 open at any one time and we do it by incrementing an absolute count, which is a contrived way. Why not just say is 100 open? Uh, and manage that and do what you have to with absolute counts under the covers. I think our, like there have been a number of recent issues with uh, HP2, which uses exactly that mechanism. And um, though it is possible to defend against various attacks against that, it's, it's quite annoying. Um, and ma manually incrementing the subscribe ID or manually incrementing a stream ID does two things. It both limits the maximum number of simultaneous subscriptions, streams, whatever the resource is, as well as limits the rate of an increase in that resource at the same time. So it gives the peer the opportunity to do both simultaneously with a single mechanism. Yeah. Would be my uh, statement. That's a good argument. I buy it. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, like hearing the discussion. I think this would be like the hardest PR, if I can uh, say, because at the end of the day, uh, it does not matter what the max subscribe ID is. It basically maps to, can that max sub -sub subscribe ID, when it maps down to the stream resources, can that be supported or not? Um, you might just have one subscribe ID and have all the stream resources to taken away. If, uh, sure. if someone sends like every byte of a chat message on its own stream, it can be done. So. I'm, I'm not against the limit, but when we write it, we need to kind of think how do we want to uh, kind of be dynamically adjust this one. I think yeah. you can handle it though. So. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think this goes back to Lucas's point that like there's a number of ways resources could be limited in the system and we don't really have text on almost any of them and, and part of it's because I think, in my opinion, we don't have quite enough implementation experience to really write text that's, but we're probably not going to write normative text anyway. I'm not really sure. Anyway. Uh, well, I guess you're up. Just time check. We're about five minutes, uh, seven minutes from the end here. And there's one more slide on who picks the track ID. So like oh, hustle no. through what I like to say. If you only have a minute, if you save it for the last minute, it only takes a minute. So. You just wasted 20 seconds. Um, uh, so when I first read this, I thought you were talking about max subscribe IDs for a given uh, track. But when I read the issue, it seems like it's talking about a global thing unrelated to how many, so you could ask for 10 tracks and still subscribe ID is limiting whether you can get 10 tracks or not. It's, it's a session level limit is the intent. Yeah. So the resource, I'm, then I'm very confused about the resource you're trying to protect because uh, I, I, could, I could do another session, right? And so what, what, what resource are you trying to protect that you couldn't bypass that limit by, by doing another thing that's, that's legal? I mean, certainly at the, at the limit, like these things all require memory, potentially upstream connections, like other things. Um, and so 
uh, one can imagine a situation where the subscriber does not have the bandwidth streams, whatever resources to actually deliver all the subscriptions it's asking for. And it asks for like an enormous number of subscriptions. So like, um, that's an example. I don't know, I'm, other people can contribute. Thoughts. Well, I actually thought that would be a better use case for having this on a particular track. That it, would it make sense to have a thousand subscriptions on one track, wh whereas <clears throat> having a thousand subscriptions outstanding period may not may not be an unreasonable thing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I think the limit we need to enforce is the maximum number of concurrent uh, subscribes that are open across the session at any point in time. Now, that said, if we do it through, if this is the syntax and way of doing it, I can, I can live with that, I can see it, but that, I, I, I don't, I think this is somewhat different than a lot of the HTTP cases because so many of these sessions will be like long lived, like months type thing, and we'll be doing a crap load of subscribes and unsubscribes. So, but I think in the end, as long as there's some way of enforcing a uh, concurrent mechanism and for the client to be able to clearly understand what that maximum is um, but that's the the key thing and all the rest of like how we organize the bits the, the deck chairs on the wire to get to that point i don't care oh, thanks um, oh, lucas you're back yeah to, just to say uh, what, what's what's coming out to me is that yes this is all about concurrency but it, it doesn't sound like it at all um, and for people who write APIs like W3C or people who write libraries, we model it in terms of concurrency to make it easier for users. But at the wire level in the protocol, we're using this because this is a much better way than saying there's this, this limit that is basically a, a bucket of stuff that goes in and out rapidly. And you can pack a single packet with hundreds of messages that cause kind of work to be done that's pointless. And that's what we're trying to protect from. So yeah. I'm volunteering to help with the text on this when you get to it. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Jordi, <laughs> um, hi, Jordi. <clears throat> uh, I think that we should uh, use limits always, and it, this this seems more uh, that needs to be concurrent because uh, because the subscribers uses memory, and what we want uh, subscribers and announce. I uh, see the, the the next question uses memory and we need to protect that memory and i think this could be more like a protection against an attack so put this level put this uh, maximum into a reasonable number and then we can handle the load and load balance we can talk about uh, that in another uh, session yeah thank you okay thank you um do we have one any... minute okay next slide okay um there's a proposal to rename track idea to track name alias or track alias. Uh, uh, that seems plausible. Um, just to make it clear that it is a compression scheme. Um, but now that everyone has everything has a subscribe ID and we're going to deliver everything in duplicate, um, what is the track ID exactly or track name alias actually doing? Questions? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have an opinion. Mm. We got a yes. <laughs> Man, I'm not sure if we got a chance to read what was on the slide before you put that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, may, that may influence the number of no opinions. All right. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to go back here. This is sort of a funny waste of time, but could we go to the slide? <laughs> um, I've, I've tried to kill it. I don't know if I'm successful in killing it. The, uh, but the, yeah, but the, 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 yeah, the slide does actually um, talk about the change to um, allowing for a subscribe error for an alternate ID if the publisher wants it. So. Um, So I, I mean, I, I, I'm strongly in favor of us going and doing this, and I think this would like unblock a bunch of other things if we could get to this. So I'd, I, you know, I, I'd really like to try and, I mean, maybe we need to discuss it later this week or whatever. Maybe we need more time. But um, if people who have read this bug are okay with this, or people don't care, I think you know, this would be a big move forward if we could answer this question. <laughs> it would be nice. Yes, Luke. Oh, yeah. No, right. no, go ahead. I think just to answer your question and Alan's question earlier, what's different between subscribe ID and track name alias? Uh, it's publisher can choose. Uh, subscribe ID has to be incremented by one every time for max subscribes. 
Whereas this alias, tracking alias, it's just a varint. It's arbitrary. It could be a hash. Um, so they're not the same thing, and it still needs to exist. I'm going to ask a challenging question in the working group and interject this. Um, if you get duplicates for each, like you get an, a single copy of an object for every single subscribe ID, which is the current model that we kind of like discussed earlier today, um, does one deliver, like, are things associated to the subscribe ID or the object or the track ID? Like, how would you differentiate between like copy one and copy two of the same track? Yeah, I, that was the question I was asking earlier. Do we need to include subscribe at the, based on the must do duplicate or must not do duplicate, which sounded like it was the consensus? Don't you have to put the subscribe ID into the object message? Yes. And then if you do, do you need both? You don't need the track ID at that point because it's just a lookup table. I would argue with right. that was why I was asking the work group. I, Ted, you want to say something? Please. Well, so I, I think it's actually two different pieces of information. And at this stage of the game, I think we actually do want to keep them as two different pieces of information. Okay. Because if we don't, then the ability to change it uh, in the future, where we've discussed, discovered that uh, you know, our, our, our way of doing the object model um, uh, needs to, to, to shift, then we can't do it because we've now tied it to another piece of the the puzzle. So I would say at this stage of the game, they should remain uh, two different pieces of information. It's not much overhead, uh, and it's kind of a premature optimization to, to make one implicit in the other. And if later we find out that they really do turn out to be, uh, it's always the same bloody lookup table, we can take it out. But right now, I would argue, leave it in. I, I, am, I am fine with that. Um, we have a queue. Please lock the queue just in the interest of time because I know we're at time. But, uh, well, yeah, I was just asking the question and you basically just addressed it, which was they may be different things syntactically, but what's the use case where they need to be different? And I heard Mo just mention wildcards and maybe that's it. But if it's not wildcards, I really don't comprehend the use case where we need two, two different things that both increment every time you make a new subscribe ID. And it, I, my preference would be leave it out and then add it back later if we find we've worked ourselves into a corner. Thank you, uh, Colin. Colin, um, so I'm strongly in favor of two different things, and, and not because of anything to do with wildcards layer. Even if we ever try and deduplicate, we're going to have two different subscribe IDs, which are going to have to have the same track ID. And I think the important thing here is who chooses these things. The subscribe IDs are obviously in this incrementing, very simple thing. The track IDs are much more flexible in how they're chosen. And, in, and we even have some control over which side shows, chooses with this. Um, and it might be that an implementation, if, if the full, it might choose the track ID purely by tra hashing the full track name, in which case they're going to end up with two different subscribes for the same full track name, we'll end up with the same track ID. Um, you might have a different implementation that actually gave them different track IDs. And I, I think that we just have to be okay with that. that that's how it works here. Um, it is that the, you know, the track ID is an alias for a full track name that was negotiated in the subscribe. And it has really nothing to do with the transaction ID for the subscribe. And I think we have to keep those separate or we're just going to get into trouble. I think what you're noting is that if we're going to keep both IDs, we probably should also have editorial text that like they're just different and don't try to act like they're the same thing. Yeah, yeah, one is a is an identifier for the subscribe transaction, and the other one is a compression identifier for something that has actually nothing to do with the subscribe. It's a compression identifier for an object, not even a subscribe message. It's for an object message. It just happened to be transported in a subscribe message. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Serious. Yep. Uh, probably I, I'm going to repeat what Colin said. I'll be quick though. So when publisher publishes an object, the object belongs to a track, not to a subscription. A subscription ID or subscribe ID is more of a transaction, is in hop I think, uh, and 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 it, it not, need not have to be carried in the object. Because when the objects come to the client, the client knows the object belongs to a track and how to organize them and we don't have to have a subscription ID to for the client to tell how what object belongs to what subscription ID. It all belongs to the same track. We are uh, the mock is about pub sub on tracks, not on subscribe IDs. So we need to have these two things as separate uh, semantic concepts. Yeah, Luke. Um, one final wrench: if the subscribe ID is in the object, I think it's what you suggested for the conclusion. 
I, I don't think publisher chooses makes I, sense for the strategy, no, right? No, no, no I, 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 if I misspoke, if I suggested that in any way, I, that was not okay, it. Okay, okay, okay. So track ID or track name alias is the only thing in object. Yeah, so I, I think I have that, that, that's not correct. That would be my error. Sorry. Okay. No, so byte for byte, the objects for the three subscribes you have would be identical. Right. So, okay, so the answer is we're going to do this. We're not going to make any other changes, and we're going to see how it works. Wonderful. Okay, uh, that brings us to the end of today's session. We will see you again later in the week. Thanks, everybody. It's been very productive. Thank you. I think, I think Helen ended up doing a little work because I think Ali forgot he volunteered because I never assigned type. Oh. So the chocolate goes to her. Oh.